Welcome to Modern Education, the show that dives into all things relevant to learning. Modern Education has a guest each week for an in-depth conversation about some aspects of teaching and learning. Join the host of Modern Education, Benjamin S. Woodford, as we continue to evolve the important topics for effective learning today. We will unpack the ways community members, students, teachers, parents, and researchers approach learning in all its forms. And now, introducing the host of Modern Education, Benjamin S. Woodford. Hello, I'm the uh, host, Ben Woodford, here on Modern Education. Welcome back to another exciting episode with a guest live, uh, not in the studio, but calling in today. My guest today is Carrie Keating. She's a life coach, entrepreneur, mother of three, and I don't think these titles even begin to describe her dynamic abilities. Carrie is one of the most positive, honest, earnest, giving, and inspiring people I've had the pleasure of meeting, and it is my pleasure to bring her on to the show today. So let me just bring her up here and see how she's doing. Carrie, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi, Ben. Thank you. Such a joy to have you on the show. I'm glad all the the phone stuff is working. Sometimes it's spotty, but you're here and we are talking. Thanks again for making the time. Yeah, you know what? Thank you. And thank you for that really amazing introduction. Um, I feel extremely humbled and just uh, honored to be you know, sharing and, and chatting with you today. Well, you know, I wouldn't have said a word of it if I didn't mean it. So well-deserved, believe me. Thank you. Okay. So I wanted to start by just giving the audience an idea of who you are, kind of what you do, how you ended up where you are. And if you got a, a story or you could give us a little bit of background on how what you're doing now and how you ended up doing that, that would be a, a great background for the, the guests or... Yeah, of course. So, um, as Ben said, I am a mom to three kids. I have three boys under the age of five, and uh, I live in Portland, Oregon. It was about three years ago when I had two year, two kids, uh, two young kids. They were under the age of two, and I was working in corporate America. Um, I had been working the nine to five grind since uh, right out of college, and I started to kind of look at my life and say. What, what, what am I doing? Where am I going? I'm paying $30,000 a year in childcare. Um, and I'm working for a great company and love my job, but I really wanted to be available for my children. So I opened up my mind and um, found uh, the vehicle of network marketing, which allowed me to come home and be with my kids. And it was through the process of, um, you know, starting to work this business and starting to really dive into um, personal development that I realized that, um, you know, there is a lot of people who are going through big transitions like I was leaving my, you know, well, I mean, how many transitions have I had in my lifetime? So many from um, college to the workforce, from, you know, working corporate America to being an entrepreneur, from uh, not having children to having children, all of these like big life transitions. And I noticed that, you know, there's not a lot of support for people. And I saw a kind of a gap in the marketplace and thought, why don't, why don't I use what I know and what I have and start serving people in this way? And so life coaching found me. Um, I hired a mentor to help me with my business. And um, it was through that process that I, uh, I saw, um, you know, really this vision of what I could be doing for other people as well. So that's what I'm doing now. But I am, you know, uh, I'm from Southern California originally, um, from a little town called Encinitas. Um, And I moved up to Portland, Oregon about seven years ago. Um, I have, uh, I'm one of four children. My mom had four kids under the age of five at one point. So I'm just kind of repeating the cycle what I'm doing. Um, So I grew up in a very chaotic and very loving and very um, exciting environment. Um, And yeah, and I'm just, I'm just uh, trying to kind of step into that role myself. So yeah, yeah. Well, it is amazing how much life it tends to repeat itself. And it's really neat how you're seeing the, the parallel between your mom's life and your life now. And that's, uh, I'm sure your mom would be proud. Yes. I'm more <laughs> proud of her, I think, than she is of me, actually, because being on this end now, I see all of the hard work that she has done and, and gone through. And it's, uh, it's, 
super inspiring to me. Yeah, I think most parents are really happy to hear that appreciation from their kids. But at the same time, I bet she would say she's more proud of you. So, yeah, <laughs> probably. <laughs> so you're a life coach. Right? Yeah. Okay. Now, yeah. I think it'd be really great if we could get an idea. I don't think most people have ever worked with a life coach. Maybe some people have heard of it, but there may be some, you know, misconceptions or misunderstandings about what that actually means. Do so you think you could fill yeah, us I, in on what does it mean to be a life I coach? Can, <laughs> I can do my best because it really is a blanket kind of uh label for people who do the work that I do. Now, I'm a life coach, but I definitely have a zone of genius in terms of business strategy. So while I focus heavily on business, mostly taking people's ideas from their brain into a business plan, while you do that, a lot of the life stuff comes up. Right, you start to you start to explore. Okay, especially for entrepreneurs, when you're trying to value your business, when you're trying to evaluate. Okay, what do I really have to give to this world? A lot of this stuff comes up, inclusive of like resistance. Like, what? Pro, what how does resistance show up for you? Whether it's procrastination, whether it's laziness, whether it's fear of failure or fear of, fear of success, or constantly getting yourself in a state of overwhelm. And so, what I do as a life coach and and Pete, there's different modalities some there's life coaches that help with grieving there's life coaches that are healers there's life coaches that are just kind of your best friend and you get on the phone with and um and help you through transitions um my special specialty is really revolved around business but it's in that process that all of the life stuff comes up so I think, you know, it's, it's a really hard thing to label because while I call myself a life coach, I think people, people can, can understand that. Um, or I call myself a business coach. I mean, if you check my Instagram, I change that label like every other week. I just try <laughs> new things on. I'm like, lifestyle entrepreneur and business coach is what it says right now. Sounds um, like it's you know, evolving like just like you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, exactly. And I think, um, you know, once, because as I kind of grow and do this more and everything else, I'm really starting to feel out like, okay, what's my niche? How can I, how can people who are searching for me find me better? And I think that blanket statement of like life coaching, while it's great, it's sometimes people are like, oh, I don't need any of that woo woo stuff. Right. So right. it's, uh, <laughs> which a lot of people think that that's what it is when it's, when it's really not. I mean, there's definitely some of it, obviously, but well, let's, let's try yeah, to dig exactly. into that a little bit. So woo woo <laughs> yeah. stuff or, you know, life happening, right? These are kind of the things that maybe are, are soft enough that people think, oh, I don't need to pay someone or, or hire someone to help me with that. But at the same time, these, you know, these belief, these lapses in belief are, are instrumental for entrepreneurs and people who really want to make something happen in their lives. So how do you help someone get past that? Or what, what, can you give us an example of how someone would bring a problem like that to you and what you would do to move forward? Yeah, I, I, and I, I, an example came to mind, and I hope this answers the question, but, you know, I, I think it really starts with being open to hearing from somebody else what could be standing in your way, right? And then the next step is, like, making the investment in saying to God, to the universe, to yourself that, like, I'm ready to step into this calling. So whether it be, you know, paying for a coach. Now, there, you, the, the best entrepreneurs in the world are extremely resourceful, but they also have coaches to help guide them to see, you know, so they can see their blocks because sometimes you're trying to get stuff done and you don't realize that your relationship issues are, ha are, are causing, you know, a blocks, that your money story is causing a block. Um, and because it all happens a lot of the times on a very unconscious, subconscious level. Um, so I know that it's kind of like a roundabout, but really, it, you know, to, to try to answer the question in a, a clear as mud way, it's really about, um, you know, taking that first step and making the investment and then kind of navigating through, okay, well, where do we have to go next? Does yeah. that answer your question? Sort uh, of? I think it's getting there. Yeah. So let, let's see. Okay. If, let's see how, how we're doing here. It sounds like what you're saying is that a person's life is so interconnected. There isn't just one thing that can stop them. And 
even if there's something stopping them, say, in business or in, in a personal goal, there are other factors at play that are, are deeper or more interconnected within their lives. So it's not just this one thing that you can say, oh, look, here's a piece of tape. Now you can stick that together and everything's better. Is that, is yep, that kind exactly. of the, the essence of what you're saying? Yeah, exactly. And, you know, as much as when, when you can be super resourceful and Google and listen to podcasts and all those things, it's a different ballgame when you have somebody one-on-one walking you through it and really able to dive into in a super no-judgment zone, um, you know, strategic way of saying, you're here and you want to get here. Why are you not there yet? And what do we need to do to close that gap? Mm, Yeah, yeah. So you're helping them see their own goals in a way where you guys can talk about it. And it's not them on their own trying to muster up the belief and muster up the new ideas completely on their own. But it sounds a lot like also that you're not just giving them all the answers. Maybe you don't even have all the answers. Most likely you don't have all the answers. So exactly. Yeah. So maybe there's something else going on there with the the constructing knowledge together and giving them an ear to lean on where you'll listen and give of your full attention to really try to let them flush out what, what they need? Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. And I, I honestly think that's just a small portion of it. A lot of it, for me, a lot of it is about action because I'm in business, right? I, I try to special, I specialize with people who are wanting to get somewhere specific and they're holding themselves back for some reason because if they weren't, they would have been there already. So they have this certain level of resistance. So while we can be super clear or get super clear on what you need to do, the other part of it, the big part of it is actually hold, helping hold you accountable to doing it. There's, a, there's some sort of quote, um, I, I, don't, I forget the percentage, I think we're 72% more likely to hit a goal, don't quote me on this, but 72% more likely to hit a goal if we share a fr- with a friend about it. Wow, yeah, so you are essentially, is it safe to say a friend for hire? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, you know, well yeah, I guess you could say that. I mean, I'm super close with all my clients. I love them dearly. I have a heart for them and I want their best interests at heart. But it's, so di- sure, it's different I'm a friend than that, for hire. Though, right? You are yeah, you are their friend and you are their support, but you are also there to help make action, which also sounds different than a, a like a therapist or a counselor, right? You're not there to just sort of talk through their problems and say, "Okay, we'll talk again more next week." You're looking for action, you're looking for actionable ideas and actionable areas of their lives to actually find some improvement and tangible results. Yes, exactly. I think sometimes, I mean, I I have a therapist. I love therapy. I think it's great to kind of dive deep into like, well, why am I behaving this way? But you could do that all day long and talk about it to your blue in the face and go down 10 different avenues. But unless you have a clear action plan on how to move forward and have somebody just kind of helping gut can guide you and push you in the right direction and to, to just kind of confirm, yeah, I don't give my clients the answer because sometimes I don't know. But also, if I give it to them, it's my answer, not theirs. Right, right. So, so. It's, not their, it's not their truth. Right. And so I have to help guide them to what's true for them, whether it be, you know, how they want to show up. I mean, it's, it's anything from how they want to show up on their social media platforms to make sure that the way they're talking to their clients is in alignment with their highest values. So if they want to have a social um, social attachment to uh, uh, their their business, you know, how do they talk about that in a super authentic way without it just being like something that's on trend? Um, you know, it's like it's really it's so many it's so much deeper I think than it really sounds um, and super super powerful. Yeah, yeah. So I, I wanted to move on a little bit, but we're we're going to be talking about this for a while, so don't get too excited about a new topic. But okay. I'm, I'm thinking about. The the, the role of a vision within this, your vision for the other person, their vision for themselves, their vision towards their goal. Where, does that, does a vision fit into the progression that goes on between you and your clients? 100%. How? I think it's so important for you to get really clear on where you want to be in 10 years, where you want to be in five years, where you want to be in one year and where you want to be in 90 days. Because I think so many of us overestimate what we can accomplish in one year, yet we underestimate what we can accomplish in 10. 
So you might say like, I want to be a six figure earner. You know, I want to have this photography business and making $500,000 a year and doing all of these things. And and it needs to be done by next year this time. And it's a really unrealistic goal. So if we can understand what the longer vision is, I think it does two things. One, takes a little bit of pressure off you. Um, And two, it's like GPS coordinates. It's like it allows you to really gut check those bigger decisions on does this get me, does this next decision is hiring this new, is uh, launching this new program, is, you know, anything that you're doing in your business, is this going to get me closer to my vision? And if not, then do I need to change my vision? Is my vision changing and evolving? Because... I, I bet you could ask any single person on the planet who has any sort of air quotes success and they'll tell you they started out with one vision and they, they are, they're currently working on a completely different vision. Right, right. So it's not so much that the vision needs to be steadfast, well-formed and permanent as much as it needs to be formulated. And as uh, uh, I'm thinking of like a road trip, right? Your vision is sort of the route you plan to take. But you may end up yep. you may end up changing routes. You may end up making some unexpected stops. You may decide that you don't want to take the whole road trip and change directions altogether along the way. But that that initial starting point still required some kind of plan. Otherwise, you're just wasting gas and doing loops in the car. Exactly. And sometimes those loops and that gas wasting and that rest is totally necessary. But, you know, like a car, if you're going to drive a car for three weeks, it needs to at least rest at some point. Mm. (laughs) But yeah, having, having that just, okay, that vision to get you out of bed in the morning to, to get you, keep you moving. And there has to be, you know, the emotional attachment, a lot of, a lot of in the coaching world and just the entrepreneur world. And just, I mean, Simon Sinek, start with why you have to have that why to get you moving, um, and moving towards your vision. And it's also about how to enroll people in that vision, how to, I mean, that's what business is. Like we're trying to enroll people in this bigger vision that we have for ourselves and how we're going to impact other people. And so I, I think vision is paramount in anything that you do. You know, you can say, you can call it goals. You can call it vision. I just feel like vision is, is, uh, you know, more like a 10 year goal or a five year goal and kind of like, okay, this is where my life is going. I know it can change because I'm open and trusting that whatever I bring in, whatever experiences that I have are going to help get me to a version of this. Um, but yeah, I, I, I ha- you have to have a reason to get up and start moving. Yeah, absolutely. So I wanted to just try to draw a distinction here. Is vision something you see as being different than an idea? Yes. How? Everybody's got so, ideas, right? So how is having a vision different than just having an idea or a, a plan or a goal? Are those different things? Yeah, I mean, I think the first word that comes to mind is maybe conviction, right? If you have mm-hmm. a conviction around an idea and you feel as though it's it's part of your duty on this earth to bring that idea to life, that can be a vision. I get ideas all day and I keep a notebook of ideas. I have really awesome ideas and really dumb ideas. Um, but I think, uh, you know, they could be, we could call them like snapshots of the vision or just kind of like a, you know, I don't even know I don't know what to say it, of like different visions. But I think until you assign an emotional attachment or better yet, a conviction, a certainty to bring that idea to life, then that's when it becomes a vision. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a great way of putting it. And it's this, you know, the, it, this seeing the end goal and imagining yourself being there and being willing to take the steps to get there, which sounds very different than, oh, I just want to, you know, buy a new car or something. That's an idea. Or I just, I would love to start a business. That's an idea. But saying, I want to start a business. This is what it's going to look like. This is why I want to do it. And this is how I'm going to start heading towards that goal. And it seems like maybe that's the the distinction there. And everybody's got ideas. So it sounds like what you're... Yeah. And I... Go ahead. I'll say too, though, I, I do think that like, you know, if you have a vision to start a business, yet you have no idea how to do that or what it looks like yet you know kind of there's 
just this feeling inside of you that, okay, all of the pieces of my life fit together that I would make a really great entrepreneur, you know, in your head, whatever that definition looks like to you, I think that could be a vision too. You might not know all of the pieces. Like I, I knew sitting where I am now, I can look back on my life and say, oh, wow, this is what I was thinking about the whole time. Like, this is what I've been working towards the whole time. And now it's because I have hindsight. It's crystal clear that this was my vision and this is now my vision coming to life. But when I was in it, I had no idea. So I think there is, like... I think there is this kind of quiet calling. Some will say it's like the voice versus the noise. It's kind of like still your intuition, your gut, whatever it is that, you know, if you're drawn to certain ideas that all have similar qualities, it could be this like kind of underlying vision of I want to serve in this capacity. Maybe it's start a business. Maybe it's be a stay at home mom. Maybe it's be a really amazing nurse. Maybe it's be, you know, whatever, whatever it is. Um, I think that can start out as this kind of like thematic idea throughout your life. Yeah. Does that make sense? Oh, absolutely. And it's so nice that you're bringing this out into the light because a lot of people, I would, I would imagine have this feeling like they need to know where they're going. They need to have a plan. They need to have every step laid out if they ever expect to get there. And it sounds like what you're saying is sometimes it's not the well-planned road trip where you know where you're trying to end up. And when you get there, you're at Disneyland and it's going to be great. Great. Instead, sometimes you're meandering through different different trips, different strategies, and sometimes that vision can come out of the experiences and the understandings you gain through that experience. Is that sort of sum it up there? Yes. Yeah. Yes, I think that's beautiful. And so many of the people that I talk to, um, just to kind of expand on that a little bit, are air quotes, quote unquote, stuck. Mm. Right? They're like stuck in a space in their life and they're like I just don't even know what to do I don't know where to go and my advice always is just start moving in a direction (laughs) it doesn't matter which direction you go because you get to a new perspective and you'll have new acquaintances you'll have a new network you'll have different ideas and I always say okay well where do you start just start with the path of least resistance what do you really enjoy doing what do you you know like what makes you happy because we know that I know when I see somebody who really, if I walk into Starbucks and I see a barista that really freaking loves her job, you know, and she's just like lit up and all that stuff, I'm way more attracted to her than the girl behind, you know, the counter who's just like, I hate life, it's super rainy outside again, you know, the energy in which we bring to things um, is a totally an important piece of the entire puzzle. And so when you are um, doing the things that really, really light you up, you're going to bring a different energy and people are going to be attracted. So let's say you're like, I really want to like get my business off the ground, but I have no idea where to start. Go, you know, and you're, but you're super into painting, you're super into pottery, whatever it is, you're, you're super into knitting, let's say. Go to a knitting class. Go do more knitting. Yeah. <laughs> you know, go go do that because what you're going to find is that you're going to be in a much happier state. Your vibrational energy is going to be higher. There could be people in your class that you meet that might want to start a knitting company. I don't know. I'm just like throwing this out there. But um, when you're doing the stuff that really, really makes you happy, you're going to be attracting other things. Now, what happens when you do the knitting thing for, you know, a month and you're like, wow, I'm really getting nowhere (laughs) um, Mm. with this. Okay. Well, what's the next step? What else do you like doing? Um, And this is like a really very elementary, um, elementary, you know, example, but I'm just, I'm trying to paint the picture because I work with, especially in network marketing, a lot of, uh, you know, online virtual entrepreneurs, um, you know, they're just like, I'm just so stuck. And I'm like, okay, there's, there's a couple skills that you need to have if you're going to do this business right. And one of them is, you know, connecting with people or, you know, and some people are just like, I don't like to get on the phone. I don't like to do that. So I'm like, okay, stop doing that and do the things, the ways of connecting that you like doing. Go to the pottery class and meet people there. Go to Starbucks and meet people, whatever it is that really brings you joy because then you're going to start attracting people to you that might be interested in what you're doing or they might not. Um, So I always say, you know, if you're feeling stuck, go with the path of least resistance. And if that isn't clear for you, just go do the stuff that makes you happy. 
Wow, yeah, and that's such a such an interesting way of looking at it because it seems so obvious, right? Just do what you already know, do what you already like, take something that feels good and see where you can bring it. But it also almost is counterintuitive because it's so obvious, right? You want to yeah. you, you want to develop yourself. It means try new things, get outside your comfort zone, go for the thing you don't know how to do. And while that can be attractive and maybe possibly very lucrative, it sounds like there's also this other aspect of understanding yourself and using your strengths and following the things that you know make you happy and trying to develop those. Yeah. I mean, and I think, I think when people say get outside your comfort zone, it really means like, okay, when you master your skills, the level that you're at, um, it's time for you to get uncomfortable. So maybe you need to like, you know, whatever it is, you've got to do something in your business to shake things up. You've got to do something in your life to shake things up. And, um, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, I'm going to go jump out of a plane because that make, makes me uncomfortable. No, 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 no. Like do a Facebook live because those scare the crap out of you. <laughs> do, um, you know, like do, <laughs> do some of these smaller things that you've been avoiding doing. Pick up the phone, um, you know, launch your website, do that web video series that you've been wanting to do. Teach that photography business, launch that album, what, you know, whatever it is, um, when you are ready to up level your life, that's when you got to get outside your comfort zone. Um, yeah, yeah. That's, so. that, that's so interesting just to think about that because it's not that when you're, you, you have everything going for you, you need to be pushing to some new place just for the sake of doing it. It really is a deliberate progression of building up your confidence and finding when you're ready to go. And I did see your, your Facebook Live today, so I'm, I'm going to touch on that for a second with the, the, leveling, okay. the leveling up idea. I thought it was such a great way of thinking about it. You don't progress to the next level until you've really got a hold of where you're at right now and you use this video game analogy, which I thought was really great. But uh, yeah. <laughs> so it really is this idea of when you're ready, when you've pushed past your, your, your blocks and your, your struggles where you are, then it's time to find a new challenge. And that's different than just forcing yourself out of your comfort zone. I mean, the example you gave is great. Jumping out of an airplane, sure, it's challenging to allow yourself to do it, but it doesn't change you fundamentally in your practices and your everyday habits. It's more of just this adrenaline rush and maybe a bucket list thing, and that's different. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and uh, but it's, it's, it's a great practice to have, right? It is important that we get outside our comfort zone. It's important that we, what I call circulate energy, or I don't call it, I, I took that from um, Matt Kahn, but mm -hmm. like really it's, it's about like cir circulating energy around like, okay, if I feel stagnant or um, it's something in my business, I am stagnant in my business. If I feel stagnant in a relationship, I circulate energy, meaning I take a new way home. I go to a, a class I've never been to. I do something new to really just shift the energy around. Um, and I think that doing things like jumping out of an airplane <laughs> makes for great content on social media, mm -hmm. um, but it's not going to change your business. Right, right. So it really is you're trying to focus on the things that will be high leverage and useful, to, uh, I mean, in the context of your clients, but maybe just in general yep. for life, right? Finding the parts yeah. of your daily interactions that are useful to you to get to that next level of whatever it is you're trying to accomplish. Exactly. Yeah. So, okay. So I wanted to shift gears a little bit and think about questioning, right? So what okay. is, what is the role of questioning in your job or in your coaching? And when you say question, you're like asking myself strategic questions. Sure. Asking yourself strategic questions, challenging the status quo, asking your, your clients questions. How, how does that play a role in what you do? I mean, I, well, so there's a, a couple different layers to this. Mm -hmm. One, asking my, you know, like we talked about before, I don't give my clients the answer. You know, sometimes like we can see things. Even when I'm going through stuff, I can't see things because I have filters on in my life, right? Yeah, filters, you're too close to experiences. It. Filter. I'm just too close to it. Exactly. So sometimes asking strategic questions, not sometimes, always asking strategic questions to my clients will just help them see things in a different light. I mean, and it could be as simple as like, well, how did that make you feel? Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Yeah. Because 
when people have the space to talk through stuff, it's all, one, very cathartic, and two, they're able to see how they really feel. I think we do a poor job. A lot of us do a really poor job of getting our thoughts out of our brain. They're just circulating around. And so whether it be journaling or anything like that, I think that asking yourself yourself strategic questions, I have a question that I've been asking myself, which I'll share in a second, mm-hmm. um, but asking myself strategic questions and then also asking my clients um, strategic questions. I think another layer of that um, was questioning the status quo. Is that, was that, I was I understanding that? Uh, sure. Yeah. I mean, that could be a personal status quo or social or however you want to take that, but just sort of like questioning sort of underlying assumptions that maybe need to be challenged. How do you approach that or are your questions the right way to do that? Yeah, I mean, I think always asking, like, how can I do this? How can I do better? How can we as a collective make this better? Um, how can I show up better or diff- more different in my life? Yeah, I think those kinds of questions are super important. Like, if you're not growing, you're dying, mm, right? Yeah. So I feel as though if you aren't asking yourself constantly of yourself, of your generation, of the collective, like, whatever it is, if we're not asking constantly, can we do this better? Can we do this more efficiently? Can we do this without as much resistance? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, I I think those questions are super important. So yeah, I have always questioned the status quo. I'm always like, well, why are we doing this? Does this even make sense? I don't align with, you know, I was born a rebel. So um, I think it's it's a great quality to have. And it's also a not so great quality to have. (laughs) but yeah. uh yeah so i think it's important to to question all the time yeah yeah and it sounded you you were kind of hinting at this idea of like the beginner's mindset or the first principles you know depending on which entrepreneur you're yep. listening to but this idea yeah. of you know digging in on the fundamentals why are we doing this what is the goal things like that and it sounds like that's what you were alluding to about these how these questions bring out what your clients already know most likely or need to be aware of to be able to move forward Yeah, I I feel so we already have the answers. We just go to work to make it really complicated Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because we have all of these different filters of life um, is standing in our way. And so it's like we already know, you know, if I were to sit there and I've done this before, it's like I get on a call with my client and they're frustrated about something. I'm like, what do you think you should do? And they'll say, you know, X, Y and Z. I'm like, have you tried that? And they'll say, no, I'm like, why don't you go try that? And then call me back. <laughs> <laughs> it so seems so it's, simple. <laughs> right. <Yeah>. Um, <laughs> uh, so I, I just, I feel like, you know, we already have the answers. Like there's so many Pinterest quotes, right? You all, like, all of the answers are already inside of you. You just have to be able to drown out the noise and tune in to what it is that you need. Um, and I think having a coach, I mean, it's, it's changed my life, uh, definitely um, changed my business. And having a coach, it's been so powerful in me being able to identify the noise versus the voice and all of that stuff. So Okay, so you have a coach too. I have two. You have two That's coaches. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Tell yeah. me about that. So how is that dynamic for you of, you know, the, the difference between learning to listen and put your faith in someone else versus being the listener and having someone else put their faith in you. Yeah, totally. So uh, I, um, uh, typically when people, my ideal client, right. My avatar, the people that I typically coach are about just like me where I was a few years back. Mm. So I'm now doing the things that they want to be doing. My coaches Um, are doing the things that I want to be doing. And they're helping guide me um, and shorten shorten the learning curve for me. Because again, I'm in business. Some of the life stuff is a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Um, But I'm, you know, one of my coaches, a coach of coaches. She taught me how to coach. She taught me her system. She taught me how to identify, you know, how I can serve my clients in a really powerful way and where to find them and how to talk to them and, you know, all all of the fundamentals of business. Um, So I hired her and um, yeah, she's been my coach for almost a year. And then my other coach is a strengths-based coach. And she um, has really, we did the Clifton Strengths Finders. She's trained in that and then helps me identify, you know, we've, we've been coaching through my top 10 strengths and really how to point them um, in to, and utilize them in my business. 
Um, and then, but I also, I mean, I invest, I'm doing Marie Forleo's B-School right now. I am doing another um, online coaching program. I am constantly investing in personal development. I'm mean, constantly investing in myself because if I'm not growing, I'm dying, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so as much as I'm, you know, it's like, I, I love my coaching business. I love where it is, but it's going to evolve. Um, you know, I see my, my long-term vision is to serve people in, in mass. And so um, one-on-one coaching, while it's amazing, um, I, I definitely see myself going other places. And so um, I have to, you know, invest in my future as well. And so I have a coach and I love it. I mean, it, it has changed my business and my life. Like I said, you know, I think we all, uh, my entire life, I've always wanted mentorship, somebody to come alongside me and say, hey, Carrie, you're really amazing at this and we've got to work on this. And that's going to help shorten shorten your distance to success. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I always wanted that. And anytime I found someone like that, just in my natural corporate career, it it sh- it helped me skyrocket in my in my role and in my business. And so I know the power of of mentorship. I mean, there wouldn't be as many podcasts on leadership and books on leadership and all of these things. It's 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 cheap mentorship, right? And I don't mean cheap in like the <laughs> I mean right. inexpensive, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> paying by the hour um, a lot of it's out there for free yeah, so it is cheap yeah, in, exactly. in monetary amount but a very valuable probably in in the context. very high value yes right exactly right um so yeah i i'm a firm believer i think coaches um you know i i seek out coaches who are just doing you know people who have done what i want to do and they mentor people Right, right. And it sounds a little bit like, I mean, I'm just trying to pull a couple of the structural things out of this. It sounds like at some level you had to learn how to surrender yourself to another person to guide you in the process of learning how to help other people who want to do the same with you. Is that, is there an element to that of learning how to sort of surrender or submit to allowing someone to help you instead of just, you know, they can't drag you kicking and screaming across the finish line, right? This is at some level you giving yourself over to someone else's advice. Yes. Now here's the difference though, because Mm -hmm. When, when you call your best friend or your sister, like you might be listening to 10% of what they're saying. The other half, you're scrolling on Instagram or Facebook or whatever it is. You know, right. it's like you might be super engaged in the conversation and maybe you take them out of it, but they've got different filters of relationships. You know, you, you, you've got all these uh, different filters on the relationship. So if my sister's going to give me advice, I might think like, oh, well, she's giving me the, the advice because she thinks this way about me and she doesn't really understand. When you're talking with a coach, this is someone you are paying. So there is a level of monetary investment mm. in, um, you know, you're going to take what they're saying a lot, uh, you know, heavier. You're going to weigh it a lot more. You're going to listen a lot harder and you're going to show up a lot different in that conversation. So it, while, yes, I, I don't think there's any sort of submissiveness about it because mm-hmm. there's definitely times when I don't agree with my coach. Yeah. There's definitely times when my clients hang up and they're pissed off at me. Right. Um, I, you know, it, so it, it's not necessarily that I'm listening. I'm, I'm just trusting that this coach Because here's the thing, I don't make offers to people, like I don't offer my coaching services if I don't know wholeheartedly I can get them to their goal. Right. I just won't make them an offer. Like I don't just take clients. And I know that the coaches that I've hired, they they won't do that either. And so um, I, you know, I don't believe, like I I trust that they are going to help me navigate this stuff. They're going to help me navigate my life and help me navigate how to get my business and my life to where I want it to be. Mm. Um, So, yeah, I think there is a level of trust. There's a level of surrender. There's a level of willing to invest the time, the money, the energy into it's, it's basically me saying, all right, I can't do this on my own. I'm putting my money where my mouth is and I'm ready to get going. Wow. Yeah. And it's, it's great that you bring up the money part of it, right? Because there is something different that we value when we, I mean, think of a free app versus a $20 app. You're probably going to make sure yep. you try to use that $20 app because you paid for it and you decided you wanted it enough to put the money into it. And there's, you know, there's this dynamic within, I think apps, but a lot of other things we expect a lot for free. And yet there isn't 
there's generally not, even if there is just as much value in the product you're getting for free as the one you're paying for, there's something psychological about us not assigning and retaining the value for that thing because we're not investing in it. Yes, one hundred percent. And I think, I mean, I think social media is a great platform to bring value to the masses. You know, if you have tips and tricks and all of those, depending on what your modality is. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you, yeah, when you get into a coaching relationship, there has to be an energetic exchange. I have to know that you're going to be listening and you're willing to kind of step into and try this stuff on because I know it works. I see the results. Um, and if it's not working, then we can dive into like, well, why is it not working for you when it's worked for X amount of people? So, um, yeah, there has to be this energetic exchange. And for us, you know, for most of us, it's, it's a money thing. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that's what that energy is. Um, where it's for some, you know, it might just be presence or, you know, whatever. But, um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's a really important part of it. And, you know, so many people have money stories and like, well, I'm not going to invest in that because it's not going to be, um, you know, it's not going to be worth my time or whatever else. But man, if you, if you've tried everything, right. <laughs> I was listening to a podcast last night with Tim Ferriss and he said, um, something super simple. And it was like, if you've tried everything and it's not working, just do something different. <laughs> <laughs> Again, so simple, right? But sometimes we need someone yeah. else to tell us that so that we can listen. Uh, yeah, I was, I was talking with somebody yesterday and basically I gave him a piece of advice and then I said, wait a second, I should really listen to my own advice. You know, and it's, it's this funny thing again, where we have the answers, but we don't always bring them out and use them when we want to, or when we should. So it's a powerful thing. Yeah. And it's actually to, to that point, you know, I, it's funny, but I, I coach myself a lot. Like sometimes when I'm coaching my clients and I'm just in in my tap, in my flow, everything, sometimes I hear myself say these things and I'm like, wow, I, I needed to say that apparently I needed to hear that apparently and it helps in my growth too. Right. So, um, yeah, I'm, I'm so right there with you taking right. your own advice. Yeah. Well, the funny thing is, is teachers generally learn more than the students. So your, your act of helping other people and this, 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 energy you're putting into helping improve other people's lives, I'm sure is paying off for you in spades, maybe more even than your clients can get out of it because you're doing it every day with different people. And that's a a really, a really powerful thing is being able to teach others and pay it forward. The things that people of others have done for you and the help and the guidance that you've gotten and bringing that into someone else, it, it, it facilitates an ownership over it for you that I don't think can be gotten any other way. So that's a really powerful thing. I completely thing. agree. Yeah, yeah. So I wanted to jump to just what is the best part of this whole endeavor, this coaching career that you're taking on, helping people with their, their goals? What is the best part for you? What like really stands out as the shining thing that keeps you going? You know, when I see my clients really make shifts in their life that they've been wanting to make for a long time, yet just haven't had the cojones to do it, Mm -hmm. um, and really start to step into their calling and their purpose. And I get text messages on like them getting new clients or them, you know, doing X, Y, and Z, you know, that is so fulfilling to me because at the end of the day, my coaching has nothing to do with me. Mm -hmm. I'm just the vessel. Like I'm just the one trying to help bring them enough confidence and content to help make the shift in their life so they can go out and serve and and serve into their calling. So it's, it's incredibly fulfilling. Um, you know, I'm literally like fist pumping my soul at night going like, yes, we did it. I mean, (laughs) there's some days when it's like, (laughs) I'm just surrounded by children all day and I'm like, Oh my gosh, I'm just glad we made it to the end of the day. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, I, I mean, I think it, it's just really about like me getting excited. I, I also like there's some days where I'm just like, ah, I don't want to, I don't want to do, I, I don't have it in me today to really st- to do this right now. Like I don't have, have it in me to like really help them navigate this issue that we've been talking about for like three sessions and we got to get through it. Um, but then it's like, I get on the phone with them and we start talking and then the breakthroughs that they have, I mean, it's, it's addictive. It's totally addicting. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty positive. It sends off some, a dopamine response in my brain because it's just 
so amazing and so joyful. And I have so much gratitude for being able to really, really help these people. Right. Well, I think there's actually something deeper there too, because dopamine hits are generally the kind of quick fix for an unexpected surprise. And it yeah. sounds like you're exp oxytocin. explaining more, yeah, the oxytocin, maybe even the serotonin and the, the bringing in the kind of deeper, more genuine uh, glandular response, if you will. <laughs> yeah, science is not my forte. I just right. know it's a big thing. So. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But <laughs> it, it's, I think it's a different type of, it's addictive in a fulfilling type of way. And it's not like you just hit a slot yes. machine, but it's like you just f did something fulfilling and deep and meaningful to you. And uh, yeah. I think we can all understand that in some respect anyway. I mean, yeah, the, those, those hard days though, there's always, those always come up. And I mean, I, if I'm being a hundred percent authentic, I was feeling a little bit like that until we got onto this interview and I just hearing your energy and excitement. Now I'm feeling so happy about everything. And it always brings me back to why I'm doing this too. You know, the people yeah, and the connections. 100%. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So what about the hardest part? You know, what, what makes it some of those days where you just don't want to get out of bed or, I mean, I'm sure you still have those. What, what kind of stuff do you do when you have those times? or what brings you to that place and how do you get out of it? Yeah, I, I think um, there's, you know, I definitely have my triggers. Um, I, I don't get to the point, I mean, aside from just not sleeping, because again, I have three boys under the age of five. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so there's times that I just want to sleep. But um, I, you know, in the, in the hard days, um, or if I feel like I'm going down a spiral, you know, because typically the hard days start with, um, which actually typically they start super, super high, and then we upper limit ourselves and, mm. you know, go, start going down the spiral. Can you explain what you mean um, by that? Yeah, so uh, Gay Hendricks wrote, wrote this book called The Big Leap, and um, he talks about how we all have a zone of genius that we um, deserve to live in at all times. And he's kind of cracked the code of like living in the zone of genius, AKA living in your calling, living in your purpose, being in a high vibe mode at all times. What everybody uh, wants, right? Conflict, <laughs> what everybody wants, this very euphoric, idyllic state. Right. Um, and what happens is, is that our brains don't think that we deserve to be in that state for very long. So oftentimes, if you ever notice, um, and I'm, this is a really low level overview, not even high. That's like, okay. It's we'll run out of time if you get yeah. too deep. So <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, but uh, basically, if you start your day off and you're like, wow, this day is amazing. The sun is shining. I'm feeling so excited. I have a great day ahead of me. I've talked to all my friends. Like things are going great. And literally by 4 p.m. It's the worst day you've ever had. <laughs> and, um, you know, you've literally brought yourself down from this epic high. Right. Well, we do this to ourselves, quote unquote, self-sabotage um, in so many different forms, whether it be scrolling social media. Like one of mine is I spend a lot of time on social media and I get caught in the comparison trap mm -hmm. where it's like, well, this person's launching this and this person's doing that or I don't look like that or I don't feel like that or why don't my pictures have that perfect light or, you know, it can be the smallest little thing and for some reason we just keep doing it and then the next thing it's like, oh my gosh, my kids are yelling. Oh my gosh, I have to clean the dishes. Oh my, and all of a sudden this feeling of overwhelm mm -hmm. and so you start going down this spiral and for me I have to and now I've learned this this is something that like a muscle that I've just built I can recognize when I start going down the spiral because I have thought after thought after thought of uh, you know negative whatever it is that's bringing me down and I will turn on an awesome song um, Rihanna please don't stop the music or my kids <laughs> love Moana and we'll just like dance I'll go outside and just put my toes in the ground and get grounded and like bring my body or my mind back into my body instead of so in my head. Mm -hmm. um, I'll take the dog for a walk. I'll do little things like that. Um, and I, I sort, sometimes, you know, in previous, like years ago, I would stay in that state. I could stay in that state for a week, maybe even a month and just be super depressed. Um, now I'm able to at least get out of it within a few hours and be like, okay, this was a day, a moment, <laughs> um, but I've got to get up and serve too, right? So it's like, sometimes it's like listening to a podcast or if I have to work that day and I'm in a spiral, I require to change my state. So I do, I, I use all these tools that I have 
the, the going outside, the taking the dog for a walk, the putting on the music, whatever it is. Um, talking to my mom or my dad, getting a little pep talk, calling my coach or texting my tribe or whatever it is um, to just help me get out of it. Yeah. Uh, well, because I require to be in a, in a high vibrational state and my, my clients require it of me. Now, that doesn't make me inhuman because mm-hmm. I am human and I have emotions, but I just try to enlist the tools that I've, I've learned over the years to help me get out of that spiral. Right, right. And how do you, do? You, I mean, I think it would probably take a whole nother hour to answer this question, but yeah. how does someone go about starting to get a handle on that? I think we've all experienced this snowballing effect where one bad thought leads to another, leads to another. Now every thought we're having is bad and, and we got to break that cycle somehow. Would you have a tip or a, you know, a sort of starting point of how someone could start to even just become aware of that? Yeah, so um, I would do something like physical to change your state. So whether it be getting up out of whatever seat you're sitting in and like walking around the room in a counterclockwise um, way, like you're you like use your body to send a, a message to your brain that like I'm going to shift this energy a different way. Um, go outside for a walk, move your body and shake out all the negative energy and put on Taylor Swift, whatever mm. it is. I would literally, I mean, it's, it's a conscious choice. You have to choose it. You have to get back in the driver's seat of your brain because what's happening is somebody else took over. <laughs> your right. ego took over. Right. And so it, you, need to, you need to kick your ego out and get back in the driver's seat of your brain. And um, you can't just do that by thinking. Right. It's, it's really, really, ch- I mean, you probably can, if you mm-hmm. like meditate, mm-hmm. you probably can do that by thinking, but the fastest way you're going to do it is if, I, if you change your physical state and do something physical to shift the energy in the room. Right. Right. And that's really powerful. It's like, if you've thought your way into this corner, maybe thinking your way out is not the approach that you need to take. Right. So you're, you're exactly. advocating making some actual commitment to this change and it can be really simple, right? Getting some fresh air, putting your toes in the water or what, something to just break that cycle so you're not stuck in the same repeti- repetitive type of thought process. Yeah, that's such yes, a, yeah, I exactly. think that, that is exactly what I was hoping to get out of you with that question. Thank you. That was amazing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, okay, so, I, you know, in our pre-interview, you had this great quote that I actually wrote it down. I'm hoping that we can expand on this a little bit, but you said that your mess okay. is your message. Oh yeah. Yeah. What, what does that mean? Like how, how, how can okay, people use so, their mess as their message? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think we as humans relate and identify and feel, I mean, it's, it's this whole, you know, me too movement when we can, show, we can show people like, wow, I am, you're on the same level as me. Like you, you get me, you understand me. And oftentimes when we're saying, oh, my life is perfect and my marriage is perfect and I'm posting all these photos of amazingness and I look this way all the time, um, it it becomes really unreal and inauthentic. Now, maybe you do look that that, that way all the time, but Mm -hmm. I think people, at least for me, I identify more when I can see a vulnerability, when I can see that not everything's perfect. And so like literally for me, it's like my mess of these three boys and Legos on the floor is often my message that like my life is just messy, but I'm doing it and choosing it anyways. Um, And the more I share about like, hey, this is the messiness of my life, um, the more people identify with, uh, with me because, you know, not everyone, I think we all have different capacities for our amount of chaos, right? For me, I thrive in chaos. Mm. So I can do two businesses, have three babies and a puppy and, you know, relation, you know, all of this stuff and travel often and go adventure and do all these things. And it ain't no thing to me, but for some, it might be a lot. And so I, um, you know, I really try to kind of bring that layer of like, Hey, I'm just like you uh, my mess is just like yours it's just different right and Does that makes sense absolutely and i just love the way you approach that idea because you seem very much to hang your heart on your shoulder and be just so authentic and real with where you're at and it doesn't always need to be perfect or pretty but you're getting it done and to me that is i think a huge part of all of that is just understanding that nobody's perfect anyway so that's not the point well 
Yeah, I mean, if you're waiting for it to be perfect, you are going to be waiting forever. It will <laughs> never, ever, 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 ever be perfect. Right, right, yeah. Okay, so we are just about out of time. I want to throw one last question okay. at you here. Okay. How do you approach failures in your life? There are no failures. Okay, there are why? only moments in which we learn. <laughs> uh, because it, if, you, if you failed at something, you just learned how to not do it. Mm. So this is one more way not right? to do it, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think exactly. That Thomas Edison I, I, I said that. I believe. <laughs> yeah, because it took him five thousand tries to find the light bulb, but all we remember him is for the light bulb. Right. Right. Electricity, not the light bulb. Sorry. Um, uh, so uh, yeah, I don't. I don't believe in failure, and I think actually when people say they're afraid of failure, it's a cop out. I think they're afraid of success. Right. Actually, I think they're afraid of who they have to become in order to be successful um, because you have to change. It doesn't stay comfortable. You yeah. have to go in and figure out, like, how do you show up into your calling the, the way you're supposed to show up? Um, and that's uncomfortable because you might not be able to watch TV every night. You might not be able to, you know, have that, like, 50 pounds extra weight on you, whatever it is, like, you know, I think I think there's this level of um, people who are saying, I can't, I, I'm just so afraid of failure because if people want something and they really want it, they will not fail at it. Yeah, yeah, that is that is such a great way for us to end. Thank you so much for making the time to come on the show, Carrie. Oh, you're Carrie. so welcome. Thank you. It has you. been such a joy <laughs> chatting with you and you've had such wonderful insights that I think a lot of people can benefit from. And once again, it's been a joy. So thank you. Thank you, Ben. I really appreciate it. Okay. Bye-bye. And this is Ben Woodford here on Modern Education. You have just been listening in with Carrie Keating, giving uh, a lot of gold nuggets from her coaching business and her own personal life. And this has been such a joy for me, and I hope it's been just as much of a joy for you. So this is Modern Education. I'll be back next week with another exciting guest and some great insights. Hope you will tune in. Thank you for joining us for this week's episode. To revisit the content from today's show or hear previous episodes, you can find us on YouTube and Facebook by searching for Modern Education. Make sure to come back next week as we continue the conversation and visit new topics connected to learning in all its modern form. The show is written, produced, and hosted by Benjamin S. Woodford. I'm the announcer, Darlene Franklin, and this has been a production of 90.1 KCCU Stanford. See you next week for more modern education.